My dear friends, good day. Why is a police investigation so challenging? Well, simply because the culprit is in hiding. But a historical investigation? Well, that's a little different because time has taken care of erasing the clues and traces of a person who disappeared a long time ago. So today, we're taking on a challenge. We're going to track down a person who has been forgotten by history and who, even back then, wanted to escape his contemporaries. This guy's the Count of Saint-Germain, who lied about his origins and date of birth because he wanted people to believe he was immortal. There's a mountain of mystery surrounding the Count of Saint-Germain. So much so, in fact, that I'm going to have to start by taking you through all of it. Because if I don't, we'll never get to the bottom of who he really was. The first problem is that there are very few direct sources mentioning the Count of Saint-Germain. And what's more, they're very scattered. In fact, this 18th century adventurer sometimes appears here and there, first in England, then in Bavaria, France or the Netherlands, Belgium, Italy, Russia and Prussia, where he finally died in 1783. That much we know for sure. The second difficulty is that there's always a little doubt about who is who, because Saint-Germain often changes his name and even his profession, from musician to dyer to alchemist to spy. And because he speaks so many languages, he moves easily from one milieu to another, navigating networks of aristocrats and scholars all over Europe. The third concern, Saint-Germain lies. So yes, first to cover his tracks when he's spying, but also to arouse admiration and fantasy. I won't tell you any more. You'll see. It's pretty brilliant. The fourth big problem is that when he lies, people believe him. So much so that even the sources of the time, even the people who knew him personally, are sometimes gullible and will say anything. And finally, the fifth problem is that he was so mystical, claiming to be immortal, that the authors and researchers who have since tried to rediscover his life are sometimes hard to believe. These self-proclaimed historians sometimes try to make connections that don't exist, when they're not outright convinced that yes, Saint-Germain was an immortal magician. And that has a sixth, rather disastrous effect, because everything is very sulfurous. And I have the impression that real historians have turned their backs on Saint-Germain. Basically, yes, it fascinates some religious people because he had a funny life after all. But at the same time, if you get past the little anecdotes about the character, you have to admit that the guy lived through this era without really making a mark on it. So there you have it, a story that makes a lot of people fantasize but doesn't really interest historians. Lies, sparse and sometimes misleading sources and research, frankly I thought we'd never get this episode done. But we can thank the Savoir d'Histoire blog for bringing all these elements together and making a really super interesting article. And it's thanks to this first perspective it has to be said that we were finally able to embark on an organized research. So, don't hesitate to discover this blog, which is full of fascinating articles. I've included it in the description. Here we go. Now we're getting to the heart of the matter. The first time he's in the news, our hero is in England during the reign of George II. We know this from letters written by a London nobleman, writer and politician Horace Walpole. The year was 1745. Walpole says that Saint-Germain arrived in town two years ago in 1743. This insane, unfeeling man assumes he's living under a false name. There are all kinds of rumors about him. He was thought to be Italian, Spanish, or Polish. He is said to have married a wealthy Mexican before stealing all her jewels, unless he's a priest, a talented professional violinist, or a wealthy nobleman. The Prince of Wales launches an investigation into this man, as one would be forgiven for thinking he was a spy from abroad, yet to no avail. Nothing was found and he was released. Nevertheless, his reputation took a hit. And in the eyes of Walpole, and no doubt many others, despite his fortune, Saint-Germain was definitely not a gentleman. Nevertheless, people admired his musical compositions, and his scores were published in 1749 under the title Musique raisonnée selon le bon sens aux dames anglaises qui aiment le vrai goût en cet art. He is also said to have composed the opera L'Enconstanza de Lusa. And that's about all we know about his life in London. From then on, there's no trace of Saint-Germain, who probably left the city or even the country. He left only the memory of his music, but without particularly attracting the protection of a benefactor or a powerful person. Just disappearing. After a few trips to Eastern Europe, he reappeared for a lasting period in Paris, where he claimed he had lived before. We can follow his journey thanks to a great fashion of the time, memoirs. At the time, courtiers liked to meet in literary salons and leave accounts of their daily lives. Examples include the journal Les Mémoires du Marquis d'Argenson, Les Mémoires sur Louis XV et Madame de Pompadour, 
written by Madame Duosse, and Les Mémoires de Félicité by Jean Lys. These are quite precious testimonies. For example, Madame de Jean Lys witnessed the reigns of Louis XV, Louis XVI, and Napoleon. Not only can she retrace the entire revolution, but she also educated many European princes and princesses, including the future king, Louis XVIII. So she has a lot to tell. But be warned, many of these memoirs are also biased, as the various authors contradict each other when they're not outright forgeries dating from much later. In any case, cross-referencing them, it looks like Saint-Germain made his debut at Versailles in 1758. He had the support of two important people. First, Abel François Poisson de Vendière, Marquis of Marigny, who was superintendent of buildings, i.e. in charge of designing and maintaining the royal palaces. And in the age of Versailles, that's no mean feat. And then Abel François has a sister, Jean-Antoinette Poisson, better known as the Marquise of Pompadour, mistress to the king until 1751. She still has a great deal of aura at court and remains a friend, confidant, and advisor to Louis XV. So with such support, the Comte de Saint-Germain can pretty much do as he pleases. But be careful, because at the end of the day, it's still a job. Saint-Germain is going to be looked after. He's going to be able to have a bed and a place at the table, but in return, he has to entertain the king, distract the courtiers, in short, become a worthwhile attraction. And it has to be said that he gives it his all. As in London, his fortune of unknown origin is obvious. Sometimes during a discussion, he offers a precious stone to someone, as if it were a worthless joke. He's a real Count of Monte Cristo. Everyone wonders where he comes from. He has a real talent for telling his stories and his travels, but also his tales of the past, which he knows extremely well. In fact, he seems so cultured and well-educated that he has the opposite effect on the French as the English. It's hard to believe he's not a true gentleman. So, in 10 years, he's either improved his flirting technique or he's really experienced some exciting things. Various witnesses attest to his erudition. He speaks many languages, masters science, medicine, history, plays music and paints beautifully. So much so that he sometimes dined with Madame de Pompadour and King Louis XV himself. But it was another talent that gave rise to his legend. After all, Saint-Germain was a chemist. He was given a room inside the Chateau de Chambord to conduct his experiments. His aim was to improve fabric dyeing processes so that France and its king could produce top quality garments, silks, and tapestries. So when he's out on the Loire, isolated and far from Paris, people start to wonder. And if Saint-Germain wasn't just a chemist, but an alchemist, that would imply that his huge wealth came out of nowhere. However, at the time, alchemy, like magic, was a subject that fascinated and amazed many people, even the very well-educated, who took it seriously. In the end, the theory seemed likely. What's more, at the same time, Saint-Germain was perfecting his legend. Until now, in England, he had been content to say nothing. In any case, we don't know where the rumors about him came from. But in France, for sure, he's taking his story into his own hands and reinventing a whole past for himself. In fact, he even hints that his past is much, much longer than we think. He may look like a man in his 40s, but when he narrates an event from France's ancient history, you'd think you were there. In 1759, Baron Charles-Henri of Gleichen tells how Saint-Germain adapts to his audience. To a scholar, he tells the story of Henry VIII, who died in 1547, more than 200 years ago. To someone curious or a woman he wants to seduce, he implies that he witnessed the events, or at least, has first-hand sources. And when confronted with a simple or truly gullible person, he states outright that he, Saint-Germain, was already on Earth 200 years ago. Yes, he frequented Henry VIII and Francois I, but most of the time he avoids it. He prefers to make subplots. For example, little Félicité de Jean Lys is 13, and Saint-Germain asks her if she can't wait to be 18, and if once she's 18, she'd like to stay young for a long, long time. So naturally, the child says yes, and the Count, in all seriousness, promises that it will be so, as if he possessed the secret of eternal youth. Rumors of this kind spread rapidly through the small world of the court and beyond. Some people repeat Saint-Germain's words, distorting and exaggerating them, and soon all Paris is fantasizing about this strange man. In his memoirs, Gleichen even recounts how a comedian posing as Saint-Germain exaggerated to the point of telling the common people that he had met Jesus in person. This has really become quite a farce, and Saint-Germain's little mythomania is likely to cost him dearly. Because in the end, with such a vague past and such a fortune, 
he starts to intrigue the powerful and gets mixed up in a case of espionage. The year is 1760, and it's been four years since the Seven Years' War between France, Russia, and the Austrian Habsburgs, allied against England, Prussia, and Hanover. The weary nations tried to negotiate a peace in secret, but who was sent as a diplomat to The Hague? Louis XV thinks of Saint-Germain. After all, he could just as easily be Polish, Italian, or other. He's an impartial person, so the king sends him. But he hasn't consulted Étienne-François de Choiseul, who is the main minister. Absolute monarchy or not, Choiseul isn't there to serve as a prop. So a phony was out of the question. So he had Saint-Germain accused of treason and espionage and ordered his arrest. This is starting to become a habit. But this time, Saint-Germain won't be caught a second time. He went on the run, changing his name several times to escape his pursuers. But even with the protection of the king, there are limits. With the nonsense of pretending to have met Jesus, Saint-Germain could have run into serious trouble. For example, with the church. So he hides himself, as if he wanted to evaporate in the shadows of the night. And it's not just an expression. Three years later, we find him in Brussels, in the Austrian Netherlands. He called himself Count de Siomont and introduced himself to Count Charles de Cobens, a reform minister. He claims to have great powers as an alchemist, able to produce a gold-like metal at will, or provide remedies that cure all illnesses and even prolong life. But for now, he refuses to show his face during the day and only frequents the minister after dark. The only witness to this story is Charles de Cobens' own nephew, Jean-Philippe de Cobens, who has a deathly grudge against this con man who swindles everyone. In his memoirs, he condemns the thief for making a fool of his family, impoverishing his country, and finally disappearing without a trace, leaving behind huge debts. Finally, he would die in Hamburg after rehearsing his scams in other countries, as he had done in France and England before. Except that Jean-Philippe is wrong. Yes, Saint-Germain continues to travel, but no, he didn't die in Hamburg. We're finally on more certain ground, because Saint-Germain's last days and death are now better known than his origins and his birth. And it's thanks to his last benefactor who also became his friend. And so, here we have first-hand info, for a change. In 1779, Saint-Germain arrived in Denmark in Altona. It was here that he met an eminent figure, Landgrave Charles of hesse Kassel the former governor of Norway. At the time, Denmark-Norway was a powerful union with colonies in Africa, India, and the Indian Ocean. So, Hesse Kassel isn't just anyone. He was wary of Saint-Germain, who practically forced his way into his home, but contacts gradually reassured him, as the Landgrave was a Freemason with a keen interest in alchemical secrets. A Prussian friend reassures him that he has frequented Saint-Germain, who performs miracles and can transform a worthless diamond into a stone of great price. Reassured, Hesse Kassel confesses that he even quickly becomes a disciple of his guest. The latter then tells what may be his last lie. Son of the Prince of Transylvania, he was taken in by Gian Gastone de Medici, the very last of the Medici family. He had seen and experienced everything, Constantinople, Europe, and France, his favorite country. He tells him about his secret mission to The Hague, his adventures and escapes. If he was a swindler, according to Hesse Kassel, Saint-Germain has indeed redeemed his conscience. Together, they set up a dye works in Eckenförde, and in fact, his products were of good quality. As for his medicines, he sells them at a high price to the rich, but distributes them free of charge to the poor. But, plagued by rheumatism, Saint-Germain died on February 27, 1784. Curtain, the character leaves the stage, and honestly, even today, we don't really know what to make of it. And the worst thing is, from now on, I might even write a second episode just on the memory of the Comte de Saint-Germain. Very few historians have studied the case of this imposter who, in any case, mainly served the whims of a few rich people of his time. On the other hand, there is a whole non-historical literature that has told and even over-interpreted his life. From Hesse Castle Freemasonry, links were drawn by Helena Blavatsky and Henry Steele Olcott, who founded the Theosophical Society. Spiritual magic, combining Buddhism, Christianity, and esotericism, and the reimagining of history with ancient races of angels and Aryans, were the inspiration for Guido von Liszt, the founder of Nazi esotericism. All this little world has completely rethought the existence of Saint-Germain, and elsewhere, by quoting each other. 
but above all, by basing themselves not on historical facts, but on their own beliefs. Incidentally, I had a bit of fun tricking you too, because I said that the Count disappears, that he evaporates, that he's mysterious. But actually, that's what people felt at the time, because he was mystified. When in fact, in history, well, it's quite normal not to be able to retrace someone's life from A to Z. Because sources are patchy, obviously, we don't have everything, and sometimes a person escapes us for a few years. Now, that doesn't mean that Saint-Germain teleports from one destination to another. All we can do is collect the fragments, try to understand them, and, why not, make hypotheses to explain what happened. In short, we don't need to fantasize about history. So, see you soon on Nota Bonus or here for the next episode. See you soon.